Hello and welcome to Castles and Legends. We're in South Wales this weekend. It's our second day and our first castle for the day is Carrick Kennan Castle. Archaeological digs in the area have uncovered artefacts suggesting that the crag may have been a site of a prehistoric hill fort during the early Middle Ages and that the Romans may have had a presence in the area during their invasion of Britain. The area of Carrickennan was the administrative centre of the Welsh Kingdom of Dehubirth in the 1100s, with the royal seat being located at Deneva Castle, just a couple of miles away. The original castle was built in the second half of the 12th century, possibly by Rhys at Griffith, the Lord Rhys, the ruler of the Welsh Kingdom of Dehubirth. In 1248, his granddaughter, Matilda de Brose, granted the castle to the Normans. But before the English could occupy the stronghold, the Welsh prince, Rhys Veitchen, took control. The next 30 years saw many changes in the ownership of the castle due to family conflicts between Rhys and his uncle Meredith as they fought for the reign of the Kingdom of Deubirth. The Welsh-English War broke out in 1276 between King Edward I and Llewellyn ap Griffith, known as Llewellyn the Last, and in 1277 the castle was captured by the English under the command of Payne de Chawer, Lord of Kidwelly. In 1282 the castle was retaken by the sons of the Welsh prince Rhys Feichen, but this turned out to be short-lived as royal forces soon recaptured the castle with an English garrison deployed. The following year, the war ended and Edward granted the castle to his military commander, John Gifford, first Baron Gifford, as a reward for his services. John had been heavily involved in the Second Baron's War as well as the encounter where Clewellyn ap Griffith was killed. John Gifford was likely responsible for the extensive rebuilding and remodelling of the castle in which we see the ruins of today. This was likely funded by himself as there is no evidence of any financial assistance from the Crown for Carrick Kennan. The work likely started sometime after 1284 and was completed in the early 14th century by his son, also called John after the death of his father in 1299. It is interesting to note that the castle was likely constructed in multiple phases and these phases could have come in quick succession. The oldest part is the inner ward and it is possible that some of the masonry of the earlier Welsh stronghold survives in the south curtain. The barbican was built later against the front of the gatehouse of the inner ward and finally the outer ward was added extending down the crag to the north and east. It was during this time that the castle was briefly captured by Rhys ap Meredith during a widespread Welsh uprising but this did not last long and the castle was soon back in the hands of the Gifford family. The Gifford family remained in the castle until 1322. It was taken away from them by Edward II following the involvement of John, second Baron Gifford, in the Civil War. John was executed and the castle was given to Hugh Le de Spencer. Hugh was one of the King's favourites, but fortunes soon changed and Hugh was tried and executed for being a thief and traitor. After this the castle passed through several different hands until, in 1362, it became the property of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. Building accounts from 1369 to 70 show that significant repair work was required for the castle. The castle passed on to John of Gaunt's son, Henry Bolingbroke, who was crowned King Henry IV in 1399, and the castle was then under the ownership of the crown. In 1400, the Welsh uprising broke out under Owain Glendower. By this time, the 
castle's stronghold was being managed by John Skidmore on behalf of the king. In 1403, when the uprising had covered most of Wales, an 800-man force attacked the castle. The attack was repelled, but that then led on to a siege lasting several months, which eventually led to Skidmore being forced to surrender the castle. The castle's final battle came during the War of the Roses. It became a Lancastrian stronghold, with a garrison under the command of Griffith ap Nicholas. It is likely that it was at this point that the gun port for musket fire was inserted in the Northwest Tower. Following the Lancastrians' defeat in 1461 at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross, Griffith's sons were forced to surrender the castle to the Yorkist king, Edward IV, in 1462. To prevent enemies from recapturing the castle, the Yorkists demolished it, which took a team of 500 men four months to complete. After this, the castle was never repaired and was left to deteriorate, resulting in the ruined remains we see today. Carrickkennan Castle's outer ward consisted of an outer gate, lime kiln and angle barbican. Other buildings that are no longer visible would have included a smithy, stables and workshops. The impressive barbican made it very hazardous to reach the gatehouse and was heavily defended by two pivoting drawbridges, with each drawbridge controlled by a tower. An intriguing and rather mysterious feature at Carrickkennan Castle is the limestone cave in the southeast corner of the inner ward. Steep steps lead far beneath the castle to the cave with its connected vaulted passageway which was lined with stone. The pigeon holes built into the wall indicate it was used as a dovecote. Oh, the things we do. Steps. Right, ready? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, it looks like we've got more steps, so it is quite slippy down here, but I'm determined to get there. Well, this is really, really dark down here and steep. You know, we should have brought head torches. <laughs> yes. What is down here? I'm guessing dead end. Oh, no, I think there might be some sort of cavern. Woo! Uneven floor. And I have got Lewis behind me with his um, phone torch on. So if you don't have any torch at all, down here it would be pitch black. Wow, where's this lead? Around some more. I didn't know I was going caving today. <laughs> this can't go much further, can it? You okay behind me? Yeah. I don't know, maybe it can. Thankfully, it just seems, um, doesn't fork off or anything, the passageway, so I'm hoping we can't get lost. <laughs> we made it to the end. So from when I stopped filming, it was about another 20 meters. It did get quite, uh, the roof got quite low as well, so I had to kind of duck down, but I made it to the end. I had not quite expected this tunnel, this cave, to be quite so long, quite so, um, so quite so large. It's quite fascinating down here. But without a torch, we would be in pitch black right now. Look, the limestone. It's really quite beautiful as well. I can hear the water running. It's quite droopy. Okay, I guess it's time to make our way back up. Originally, 
the mouth of the cave was exposed to the outside, putting the castle at risk of being infiltrated by an enemy. This was deliberately obstructed from within, successfully preventing any outside attempts to gain access. Lining the passage with stone would have helped prevent undermining by an enemy and reinforce the passageway so that heavy structures could be built on top. The cave is also supposedly haunted and is sometimes known as Owen Glauglock's cave. Owen was a 14th century Welsh soldier who led a French battalion in the Hundred Years' War against the English. According to legend, he and 51 other men are believed to be sleeping somewhere within the cave system. It is said that when they awaken, peace will reign across all earth. At the entrance to the inner ward stands a three-storey twin-towered gatehouse. The gatehouse also acted as the castle's keep, so defending it was crucial. The gatehouse's octagonal tower bases were strengthened by spare buttresses to prevent undermining. It was also well protected by a drawbridge pivoted between two pits, flanking towers with arrow loops and a portcullis and heavy wooden door at each end of the entrance passage. Within the inner ward, you would have found a range of domestic buildings, curtain walls, a chapel, an oven, the northwest and northeast tower, private chambers and hall. The hall was approached by an external stairwell from the courtyard. Inside, a central open fire supported on a masonry pillar. The hall was the most important room. It would have been used for entertaining guests, ceremonial occasions and official business. The Earls of Cawdor owned Carrick Kennan in the 19th and for much of the 20th century until a mishap led to the ownership of the castle being passed on. In the 1960s, the Morris family of Castell Farm acquired the castle when Lord Cawdor's legal team made a mistake in the deeds of the farm and included the castle. Today, the castle is maintained by Cadu, but is privately owned. It is open to the public to visit for a small entry fee. We've just finished looking around the castle. And do you know what? I really, really like this place. It, um, there's a lot more there than I expected, so really, really enjoyed it. We've got a busy day ahead though, so unfortunately we have to shoot off to our next castle. I hope you will join us there. So I'm just going to say thanks very much for watching. Please do hit that like button and subscribe if you have not already. And I hope to see you at the next castle.